Well, assalamu alaikum and welcome to the inaugural episode of the forums hosted by the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are so thrilled to have all of you all joining us tonight and want to thank you sincerely for your support as it serves as one of our greatest motivators. Today, we have the literal embodiment of girl power, yes queens, hashtag squad goals, um, joining us as our panelists today. I am so, so excited to uh, present Anissa Mehdi, an Emmy award-winning journalist, and Jamia Adams, the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for Tom 2020. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Well, I love being Girl Squad. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. The only thing better than Girl Squad, I think, is MPAC Squad, and that includes a lot of girls anyway, so, so it works both ways. All right, maybe that's the promotion <laughs> from Girl Squad. Now, I want to encourage the audience to post your questions in the question and answer box below, um, and we'll be sure to ask some of your questions, time permitting. All right, so let's kind of get the ball rolling with our very first question. Um, now, ladies, there are some things we can leave the house without, you know, our makeup done, that snack that we put in our purse when we go grocery shopping. Maybe, maybe that's a me thing. I don't know if everybody does it. Um, but one of the things we can't really ever take off is our identity. And I'd like for you to talk to me about whether or not you agree. And also when it was that you first realized that your intersectional identity of being a Muslim and a woman played a role in your life, how you were treated, the opportunities you were given, and maybe even the work that you pursued. And whoever wants to go first is welcome to start. So, I am happy to go first. Um, so I am Jamia. I, I just wanted to do a slight correction. I'm the former director of diversity, equity, inclusion for Tom Steyer's 2020 campaign and served as his chief of diversity, equity, inclusion last year on his political pack. And currently I am working as a consultant and a recruiter and just really excited to be a part of the DEI space and happy to be here today. I think when you talk about identity, particularly in this country, um, you know, my family came to Islam in the 60s via the Nation of Islam, and they wore the garb, they were visibly Muslim, but they were also African American. And being African American and being Muslim, at that time was a, um, it was a benefit for the community. Uh, the Nation of Islam set up shop in many of the poor communities in the United States of America, in our urban centers, in a lot of the black communities. And they brought businesses in and they brought culture in and the benefit was great to the larger African-American community. Uh, when it came to me as far as identity, I was raised to be Muslim and um, African American and proud of both of those identities. As far as treatment, I think that when people found out that I was Muslim, it was more a fascination about questions and whatnot, but definitely treatment um, different for being African American. I was fortunate enough to grow up in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a very diverse community with people from all over the world. Um, but I definitely saw that there was a difference in treatment um, um, based on identity. And my parents had prepared me for that treatment. Um, my mother grew up in the deep south in Louisiana. My father grew up in, here in California. And both of them experienced racism and talked to me about that experience. So I was prepared, although my experiences were different. Um, as an adult, I realized that the work experience was very different. I, just like my parents said, I had to work twice as hard um, to do the work that I do. But I felt like being who I am and my identity was a strength. And knowing that, you know, I come from this diverse family of interreligious people. I come from this community of friends who are immigrants from all over the world. That I brought in as strength into the work that I do and serving as DEI um, um, professional and serving as an advocate and campaigner. I brought all of that experience in um, um, into my work, really. 
Jamia, what a contribution you must be in every one of the sectors uh, in Thank which you. you bring yourself for all of those uh, tentacles into so many parts of, of our society. Thank really, you. what an honor to sit on this panel with you. And the other thing I want to just hold up is how different we are and yet how similar we are. And that's something that I love about the American Muslim community. It just uh, encompasses the planet. Uh, the great uh, Aziz Al-Hibri, a scholar of Islam here in the States, I remember um, saying, we live in a state of permanent Hajj here because there's some of everyone. And uh, I don't know if you've had the privilege of being in Hajj. I've reported on the Hajj now three times and I've made films about Hajj. So I feel very uh, comfortable in that, in that space. And yes, America does represent that, which gives us an opportunity to really demonstrate what the best of Islam can look like. So uh, to answer your question, Iman, I was, um, I'm the product of a Muslim father from Iraq and a Christian mother from Nova Scotia, Canada. They met at the University of California. And we, were, my sisters and I were all born in California, but we moved to New York as kids. And that's really where identity, you know, bam, right hit us because um, we were no longer, uh, well, we were getting conscious of self too, but in New York where we lived in Flushing, uh, there were no other people like us. And, um, at first that didn't really matter because what was interesting was for the things that we did as kids. And for me, it was mostly being involved in the music programs in this public schools. But uh, everyone around us was either an Irish Catholic, an Italian Catholic or a German Catholic in our neighborhood. And uh, most of my close friends who weren't necessarily in the neighborhood group were, were Jewish Americans. And we had no problem relating in the areas of religion, but we did have problems when it came to the con conversation around Palestine and Israel. And that came up constantly because my father, the late Dr. Mohammed Mehdi was uh, a, 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 ver a vocal proponent for Palestinian rights from the early sixties, even before the establishment of the PLO. And uh, he was the person to which all the news media would turn whenever there was an act of, of terror committed, uh, an attack on a kibbutz or the hijacking of an airplane. I'm dating myself here, but that's okay. Um, and so they'd call him and ask him for a comment. And then by the time we got to school the next day, all our teachers had heard what he had to say and they typically didn't like it. And so um, it was a time when there was no impact. There was no American Muslim Alliance. There was no care. There was you know, none of the organizations that now come and, and stand by, uh, you know, stand up for um, situations of bias. And Jamia, you may be familiar with these also, right? So uh, that which did not kill us made us stronger. And, and, uh, and I was actually um, for a time hiding in my Christian identity because at least I could be an Arab American Christian and that would keep me somewhat protected. Uh, but after a while, you know, that was just not, not real for me. So um, the reason I chose journalism also is a, is a byproduct of this identity issue and, and, and uh, you know, coming to, to understand the identity because I was really disappointed with how the American news media covered what my father had to say. Um, he was never saying anything about uh, the Jewish community. He always talked about Zionism as the problem and the reporters would come and say, Dr. Mehdi, why do you hate the Jews? And he, I don't hate the Jews. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a political movement here. And so I decided one of the things that I might be able to do to be of help and of service was be to go into the news media and be part of the conversation around how we cover the stories that dealt with Islam, that dealt with uh, uh, the region of the world that is on the continent of Asia, the Western part of Asia, we call it the Middle East, but that's really a political construct, isn't it? So um, that's why I decided to go into journalism so that I could be there to offer new names uh, from my Rolodex for who could be telling the stories. 
so that I could be there to ask questions uh, when we had our morning meetings at CBS News, for example, about how are we gonna cover a story? And um, I worked on the foreign desk at CBS News, so I also had an opportunity there to uh, interact with just the received wisdom of the day, which was mostly ignorance. It wasn't um, intentional bias in any way that I could determine in the newsroom. It was just people didn't know much. And, and I served as a resource, which really, which really felt good. I don't know if we strayed too much from, you know, leaving our makeup back home. But, <laughs> um, no, no, this is this is what this is supposed to be, you know, it, it's a conversation and, you know, given given the title itself and, and Jamia, if you if you want to add, please go go ahead. Yeah, I would sister Anissa, thank you so much for saying and contributing what you did. We have so much in common because I, too, got into communications because of the representation that I saw in the news media mm -hmm. of different communities that I belong to and different communities that I was familiar with. And seeing here in the States the bias, particularly to communities of color, to minorities, so-called minority communities, um, was one of the my inspirations for telling the word and telling the story and understanding that we truly must tell our own stories in order to kind of uh, disrupt some of that bias. I also started my career at CBS as well. Me too. <laughs> yes, I was on the entertainment side, but I worked okay. there for seven years. So have a lot in common, but I'll defer to Sister Iman now. No, no, you know, one word that I keep hearing in both of your statements is this, is this word representation. And I think that this is kind of one of those key words that we can't progress we can't kind of have this conversation without mentioning, right? With, with more women becoming champions of their industry, we see this greater representation happening. It's something that I, along with women across the world, I'm sure are super, super excited to see. But talk to me a little bit about what representation really looked like when you were starting out and, and how you feel like it, it's made that kind of progress in, in the time since you first joined um, your industry. And, and to kind of add that extra, spin on it. I, I want to dig a little deeper by throwing that that religion aspect into this. Hmm. When you were making this decision of going into into the fields that both of you have, have kind of um, become, you know, giants in, um, was there any time that you felt bolstered by your religion? Or was there a time that you felt kind of put, put back because of it? T talk to me about that relationship a little bit. For me, there, there it's both it's both and. Um, what was the first part of the question? Because I had something I wanted to, to say. So, uh, you know, how representation. did representation? Representation. Yeah, there was, I was it. I was it. That was it. And, uh, and it, and so it, what I want to note is progress. Um, I was the only person like me in the CBS Evening Newsroom, in the Eyewitness Newsroom at Nightline. I was the only person. I actually wanted to mention to you that in 1999, I was invited to join a documentary film production team. That was ideally, the, the initial idea was to create a four hour documentary series on Islam. And I was the only Muslim on the team and the team had already been working for a year. Can you imagine the audacity of say a group of Muslims to say, we're gonna do a documentary series, four hours for PBS on Judaism. Wouldn't be taken seriously at all. But this, a year into this project, very serious project, I came along by just happenstance. Well, we know there's no happenstance, it's all the will of a greater power than we, but, uh, to be to be the you know to be a, a leader really in a leadership position in this documentary film um, so there's progress and then came September 11th 2001 and at on the 12th I could feel the pulsing in the American Muslim community which was like gosh we better get involved in this telling of our own story and that's when it seemed to me the shift really happened in this country in terms of heading into the news media, heading into journalism schools, heading into law schools, heading into public relations, heading into government, public affairs, all of that. So that was a huge silver lining on the, the tragedy 
of September 11th, but um, huge progress there. So my identity, yes. Well, I, well, let's hear from Jamia first and then I'll talk about how, um, you know, there were moments where my religion was an asset and, and whatever the opposite of asset is. You know what, uh, Sister Anissa is like my twin in 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 the movement. But um, you know, I think it's it's been an asset for me too. You know, we're both from California or born in California, and California is a very diverse community. And throughout my career, which is focused on communications and digital media, my identity has been and, and varied identity has been a benefit. Um, I started doing political and advocacy work in 2006, working for an organization that was one of the first nonprofits to use video to really push issue advocacy and include an ask, um, call your senator, call your governor and, and whatnot. Um, and through that, I was an outreach director and I had originally applied for a role similar to what Sister Anissa does as a producer because my background was in television and video production. But the uh, founder of that organization was like, oh, you're Muslim, you're African-American, you're a woman, you know, you speak Spanish. I think that you should be an outreach director. And he was absolutely, he saw this role and put me in that role because he knew that that with my background, I was used to being the only in a room. So I was in the room with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. I was in rooms with all Latino brothers and sisters, all, um, you know, I started, and I brought in the Muslim community from there and started working with the Southern California Shura Council and with Impact. That's when I first came to know Impact and started working with Adina Lekovic, who's one of my amazing friends and um, a former staffer at Impact. So that was always uh, a strength for me, that, that diversity and the fact that I felt comfortable even though I was the only one who looked like myself in the room and all those identities became a strength. Um, and also my community of growing up in such a diverse community and never hearing English on the school bus. I heard Tagalog and, and, and Mandarin and Spanish and all these different languages and, wow. and seeing different you know, children coming from Afghanistan and, and Iraq and all of these different countries of Vietnam and Cambodia throughout the times that I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So all of that was a benefit that I took into my professional career. And how lucky to have a, 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 a colleague who recognized where best to place that strength. Yeah. Most definitely. I had a little moment like that myself at uh, Eyewitness News in Boston, my first job out of journalism school. And um, there was, uh, it was the Lebanon Civil War was happening. So I was um, certainly in a few years ahead of you. And uh, uh, my, my executive producer came up to me. None of this has to do, I don't think, with being women, but I think it's important in terms of the identity question. And I came up and said, you know, Anissa, I know you've been really active politically in the Palestinian movement and the Arab American movement. Perhaps um, it would be a good idea for you not to be covering these stories right now. It might be difficult for you, you know, to show your objectivity as a journalist. So I said, okay, and he said, I'll give you the elections, I'll give you, you know, these other education, other beats. And after a week observing the newsroom, I went back to him and I said, you know, I really appreciate you looking out for me like that and understanding that I might have biases, right? But why do you think my Jewish colleagues in the newsroom don't have biases too? You know, there are different biases than mine perhaps, but possibly not as recognized or self-aware as I am and you are, I said to him, of my biases. Um, just, just a thought, and it was as if a light bulb went off in his head and he realized he had that same you know, bias in his own head. He said, wow, I suppose I should be giving you all of that stuff to write. And he did. And, and that's so interesting to hear, but, but with that, you know, I, I kind of wonder, at any point with this, you know, very proud identity that both of you really seem to, you know, pr 
proudly kind of wear. Um, did you ever feel, you know, boxed in or limited simply as the person reporting on Muslim issues, on women's issues? Was, was that the case? Was that something that you preferred to do? I will say that the answer for me for a while was absolutely yes. And for at first it was quite a, a privilege and it felt like a very important role, but then I realized that, you know, the box, my life's box, my, my um, experience box was larger. And that coincided with um, uh, starting a family, moving on to PBS, starting a family and um, taking on a role as an arts correspondent, which was really where my heart lives. If, if all of us played music together, if we sang together, if we, if we created art together, if we sat in drum circles, if we even, you know, sports is like that too, but for me it's music. If we did that, a lot of other things would fall away and we'd be living in a much happier world. So I got to cover the arts for 12 years. Um, and then I went back into reporting on Islam and, and these. What about you? So through, through my work, you know, I, I wasn't a reporter. I was an advocate um, and continue to be an advocate in communications, digital media, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, consultant. And through that work, I work with a lot of different communities. Um, my advocacy work came about really advocating for marginalized communities, working domestically on voting rights, working on immigration reform, working on healthcare reform, working on issues, um, working on um, anti-war uh, movements and working on issues um, of the progressive left, basically. And so with that work, I advocate and, and with the LGBT community, I worked on marriage equality. So I worked on what I think of as human and civil rights. And particularly when it came to different communities that were having their rights stomped on. Um, and that included the Muslim community. One thing that I found when I first began my political outreach with the Muslim community in 2006, 2007, was that we weren't using our voice like other communities were. We were not not advocating uh, around our issues. It really was discouraged um, and, and not something that a lot of the Muslim community was doing at that point. And so I was just encouraging us to tell our stories because I feel like Sister Anissa, that it is important that we do tell our stories. And in that political arena, it's key that we uplift the issues that are of concern. Um, working with the communities the Muslim community is not a monolith. I come from the African-American Muslim community and the issues that are of concern to the African-American Muslim community are very similar to the, to the overall African-American community issues. And then there are issues that um, uh, impact other communities, whether they're the Arab Muslim community or the South Asian community or Latino Muslim community or uh, white and, and new converts and uh, folks of that nature. And, and our African brothers and sisters who immigrate here, um, all of those different communities um, have issues that are important. And what I appreciate now is that these different segments of the community are really understanding their power, understanding how to use digital tools to advocate for their issues and understanding that our identities, when we tell our stories and use our stories to really propel those issues, really strengthen our resolve and strengthen the organizing that we're doing within that arena. May I, may I ask a question? Can I, may I ask why people were discouraged from telling their stories? I think that when you when um, I talk to uh, the sons and daughters of immigrants, advocacy was not really encouraged as a career per se. Um, you know, that was not really what Muslims, I, I, I attended a lot of Muslim conferences to ISNA, to all of these different conferences, and that's not the career that folks were looking at. And so that's where it was discouraged. Even among my own family, my mother was like, you're not going to ever make any money being an advocate, you know, and, and our parents care for us. They want us to be able to take care of ourselves. They want us to be able to 
be able to thrive and whatnot. And these are careers that don't necessarily pay a lot of money. And so that's why it was really discouraged. We're, we're going to need to cut out that last portion. My parents are watching right now. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to. They have encouraged know. you. They certainly have encouraged but, you. But, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that being a part of, of this new generation that kind of sees everything as an opportunity. Um, we kind of grew up with elders who were either just getting their footing in this country or were constantly pushed to find that means of comfort, comfortable living. So we'll see tons of representation in the fields of science, but we won't see any in the fields of advocacy. And oftentimes, you know, I remember growing up and being at uh, dinner parties where everyone's complaining about something and in my mind I'm thinking okay who's gonna fix it who's we have someone who if I had a heart attack could put me on the table and and put a stent in we have someone who could fix my broken arm but these systematic problems it seems like we have no representation um, in in the right kind of spaces be they media be they policy so it's so exciting to be um, you know, speaking with both of you who kind of took that leap of faith and, and were the, the foundation of what a lot of us now are able to find our footing with. Um, but you I are part of the generation, if I may, Iman, that the late Dr. Aga Saeed mentioned to me uh, years ago. Uh, he said, this new generation of Muslims in America neither speaks with an accent nor thinks with an accent. Oh, my my mom always tells everyone I live in Kentucky rural eastern Kentucky so I definitely know the feeling of being the only one in the room sometimes for most of my life and my mom has this very sweet saying that her kids are as American as apple pie <laughs> and so for, for us you know growing up there I think maybe it was in my home but it was really taught that it's more it's most important to be a good person what are you going to do with the opportunities that you've been given don't get so tied up in the, oh, I'm this or, oh, I'm that, or, oh, I can only help this kind of person. You have a responsibility until your last dying breath. I believe it was our prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who even said that even on the day of judgment, if you have a seed in your hand, make sure that you plant it. Now, he wasn't saying, you know, I'll reap the benefits of that fruit. It's that maybe that tree will, you know, serve as a as lumber for a home for the next generation. Maybe it'll serve as fruit for someone I will never meet. But paying it forward is so essential. And especially in this conversation of, of women in Islam, because oftentimes we don't have mentors in a lot of these spaces. We're looking to people um, who, who have just kind of been getting that experience. And so if anything, that the wisdom that you all are able to share has been so essential, if not empowering, for I hope um, um, all of our viewers, it, it, it's just exceptional. And I really want to thank you again for for sharing that with us. I, I have a few more questions. Um, and, and I think we're going to get a little bit a little bit deeper. So so bear with me. Um, you know, faith is often a personal experience for many people. Um, and so I, I don't mean to pry or go go in too too much limit yourself as as you wish. But what is it about your experiences with Islam as a woman that keeps you most motivated to continue with the work that you're doing now? Mm -hmm. I think that with Islam, you know, the way I was brought up, um, I appreciate the equality between the gender. So I believe that it's it's written into the Quran and it's written into the Hadith and our uh, balance, our equal yoke between both men and women has always helped propel the work that I'm doing in the sense that I don't feel held back by my gender. I also believe, and I, I know you said this about examples, like we, although, you know, um, I guess we would be considered both, um, you know, very experienced women, um, we are not the first within our faith to be examples of that. You know, uh, Nana Asma'u, who was a great Nigerian um, Muslim leader, um, is a really great example, you know, born in 1793 and lived this life of being a great poet and, and leader in Nigeria and a teacher. And we have so many different examples, you know, without Sister Khadija, we would not have our faith. We, we, we have these examples within Islam and these examples have propelled me, Sister Aisha, all of these 
um, examples have propelled me and in, in learning the stories of these great women have instilled in me uh, the inspiration to know that the, my, the, uh, what I could do is boundless, you know, it's, it's boundless. So those examples are absolutely the ones that have inspired me uh, from the beginning and also more recent, uh, uh, you know, sisters who've, who've shown example. I mean, the, the, the queens of Islam, the queens of India going on and on. I, not like you called us queens earlier. Yeah, that was cute. But um, that's something that drives me crazy when we hear some Muslim communities or some Muslim men, particularly who we would, I would consider extremists talking about, you know, we want it to be the way it used to be. Well, the way it used to be was women and men were equal, you know, so be careful what you wish for brother, you know. Um, uh, there's a wonderful CD set that I have called Famous Women in Islam. And uh, it, it's just story after story after story of the, the leaders that you've, you've described. And I'm thinking of uh, just this week, one of our more contemporary uh, Muslim women leaders died, Nawal Sadawi. What a champion of feminism, what a champion of human rights, of women's rights, of equal rights. Um, what, a, what a broad thinker and writer. And uh, I was privileged actually to interview her in the 1980s on a project for CBS News. We were, we had gone to Egypt with Morley Safer, who also has he passed away a few years ago, to do a story that was based on this new thing coming out of Egypt. Muslim women were wearing matching turbans and kaftans, and it was this new fashion trend. So we, you know, it was an excuse to go into Egypt really and start to look at what was going on with, with Muslim women. And we, uh, had Noel Sadawi as one example of a Muslim woman. And she's, you know, just right out there, you know, on the on the progressive side. And the other woman that uh, was sort of pitted against Nawal, I didn't realize this at the time, I found out later, is was Safinas Kazim, a less well known, but she got her her graduate degree at the Fletcher School at Tufts, and she was a Shakespeare uh, expert. And so she would interpret Islam in terms of what Hamlet would have said, what Beatrix would have said, you know, how, it, and she was brilliant, but she was very, what Morley Safer would call conservative. And so he interviewed each of these women. They had utterly uh, opposing views of Islam, uh, not of women's rights within Islam, let's be clear, but about, uh, what you know were you supposed to cover your hair or not things that that for us i think are less at the core but for a white american 60 minutes correspondent might have been at the core and in the end he discovered they both respected they respected one another's differing views and so he said well no story here we're going home It's, it's definitely one of those kind of points of contention where, you know, it's not so much of a, of a show. I think one of the greatest things about Islam is the emphasis on respect, be it the respect that children have to give their parents or parents have to give their children or we just all have to give one another. Um, that this concept of community, of, of loving thy neighbor, even if they're different than you is so, so essential. And one of the most beautiful things that I find, you know, if we're talking then and now, is that, you know, from the concept of even the jizya attacks of, of people being able to live cohesively and coexist together to now when I see a lot of communities that have, you know, Muslim immigrants or Muslims who have been here for generations kind of peppered in the 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 ambiance the atmosphere the the welcoming nature how how cookouts even are you know it's so so cohesive so i, I really attribute a lot of that harmony to our theme and and the fact that it emphasizes this respect but you know with every you know and easy you're, you're a reporter so you know with every good side of the story there's definitely going to be that that alternative and so in your experience, you know, with as as positive as, as it has been with Islam, and this 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 for you as well, Jamia, how do you kind of tackle those who are keen 
on sharing the absolute opposite image of what we have come to understand Islam to be. Um, what's, the, what's the approach that you really take in debunking some of those myths of, of vitriol? I think education is a key part of it. Um, you know, I, like I said before, I work within the progressive political space where um, I had to educate a lot of the organizations that I worked with, as well as the leaders who work within that organization about Islam and about the community. And so I think that, um, you know, we have this expression within the Dean Dawa. We are teachers. We are teaching our faith through our behavior, through our way of being. But it also means um, direct teaching. It also means explaining things. It also means having the patience to answer questions because we live in a country where um, you know, there is no official religion. We have freedom of religion. We have many religions here and we can educate our neighbors and uh, different organizations and our workspaces about Islam and be open enough to ask and uh, or to answer those questions if posed towards us or be brave enough when uncomfortable situations come up or ignorant sayings um, uh, come up that we speak up and we correct folks um, and let them know what the truth is. It, it's key that we stand up and, and, and be those brave warriors and have those difficult conversations. Courage and integrity. And, um, you know, I can think, I should write a book for all the stories I can come up with on this, but um, for example, the film that I made for National Geographic on the Hajj called Inside Mecca came out in 2003. And so the, the idea was to take three people from the planet who are making Hajj this year. And so I had, to, you know, what a great challenge of the three million people going, I get to choose three and educate right, our National Geographic and public television audiences through that. So I thought about that long and hard and I interviewed lots and lots of people to choose them. I ended up choosing a man from uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and an African Muslim from uh, South Africa, and an American Muslim woman from Austin, Texas. And, um, and she was originally Irish, so green eyes, blonde hair, beautiful, black-skinned African, and a very, uh, what we would call Far East, East Asian um, man, all completely different human beings. None of them an Arab, right? So by not choosing an Arab, I said something about the diversity within Islam, right? By choosing a woman who I didn't know when I chose her that she had green eyes and blonde hair, but I knew she was of Irish descent. Um, you know, you can say a lot, uh, uh, they educated the, the, the audiences for me, basically, but that's the key, is education. You know, I, I love this concept too. I joke around with our president, Salam. Uh, one of his favorite phrases is that Islam is not a monolith, that Muslims are, are, are not a monolith, right? That there is so much diversity. I think Islam is one of the most diverse religions, you know, with its with its membership <laughs> out out of so many. And so it's essential too, I think, that when we're discussing these kinds of, of of harmful kind of stereotypes, oftentimes, you know, we we see film even until I will, you know, I'm maybe I'm biased, but until the work of our Hollywood bureau at Impact, oftentimes I I feel like that the the, the the Muslims that we would see on TV were ones with accents or the villains of the movies or people who just could not, you know, coexist with life in, in the West and how problematic that is. You know, I think of the people in my life who are quote unquote immigrants or, or Muslims or people who practice differently than me. They're my teachers, they're my doctors. Some, some of them are my, you know, sanitation workers. They're my nurses, that they're, they're really, really important people who our country really couldn't progress without. Why is it that we limit how we feel about people simply with that tagline of oh they're a muslim right that that that's just a box that we shift people into 
I think people would be surprised at how robust um, the, the Ummah really is when it comes to actually getting to know people rather than just judging, judging that book by its cover, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as we kind of progress with this um, tougher kind of topic, you know, identity is something that, that both of you have, you know, again, really, really um, proudly, proudly worn and exhibited. But I will speak from my own personal experience. I'm the eldest in my family. I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me, and then my baby sister is nine years younger than me. My younger sister and I would wear shalvar kameez to, to picture day when we were younger. We were really proud to have henna on our hands and be very outwardly Pakistani, American, Muslim, you know, excited to kind of showcase that. My baby sister, however, I think grew up in a little bit of a different America. She was going, is going through high school, uh, middle school in, in the Trump era of, of politics. And so what I've noticed in her and a lot in her generation is this sombering, this, this pushing back of what our identity is. They don't necessarily at times wanna talk about it. Perhaps it's bullying. I mean, we've seen an uptick in Islamophobia. We've seen an uptick in acts of violence against, you know, women, especially or Muslims, especially Muslim women. And so with all of this kind of happening, what is that bit of advice that you would give this generation to maybe not shy back from, from their identity, but to really embrace it and why it's important for one to do so if, if it can be done in a safe kind of, in, in a safe way? I think that with young people, it's it's complicated. Um, you know, I come from parents who chose their religion, who chose to wear the garb and until they left the nation of of Islam in 1975 after the death of Mr. Muhammad. Um, but with us, they encourage us to study different ways of belief, and they encourage us to choose and. I found that with young people, you know, and of course my association with the African American Muslim community, you let them be and let her discover her journey and eventually she will come back to Islam. And not being visibly Muslim doesn't mean that Islam is not in your heart, but survival is important and um you know, I I think there is a, a piece about in the Quran, and I can't remember the exact surah, um, but if you are feel in danger, uh, you don't have to let anyone know what your identity is. And if, if there's a threat that young people feel, um, then let them be and, and, and whatnot, you know, uh, for, for myself and for other African Americans, you know, we, we can't take off you know, I can take off my hijab and not wear a hijab, and I'm still seen as black. So there's no way I can just um, blend in with any other community. I am who I am, and there are there's a strength in that because you have to to fight through that. But um, it's not easy for for everyone. So I say with young people, let them have their journey and continue to give them the good parts of the Ummah, can continue to give them the good parts of Islam and not pressure them into being any certain way or wearing their religion in, in any certain way. And I think eventually they will come back to it. I, th I think there's a lot of wisdom there. And it goes back to what Salam al Mariate says, which is, you know, this is not a monolith, which means we don't all look alike and eat alike and shake hands alike and all of those, all of those things. Um, and like I, I, I said earlier, I hid out in my Christianity, you know, that part of my identity for a while when it was just, too, I was a teenager at the time, it was just too tough. But I was also shocked at one point when uh, a friend confronted me much many years later and said um, uh, something about me passing for white. And I looked at him and I said, I'm white. You know, no, you're, you're not, you're a Muslim. And I said, you know what? You know what? You're confusing things. You're confusing uh, religion with color, with ethnicity, with language with garb. A Muslim lives here. It doesn't live on the surface like that. I mean, sometimes it does, you know, but that it's, anyway, it was a very interesting 
conversation con of confrontation with identity. Absolutely. And, and I think it, it hurts my heart a little bit that we have to have this conversation about survival, right? Like we're living in the 21st century where we feel like we've made so many strides in, in you know, the, the progress of where our nation is kind of going or even our, our, our I won't even say Ummah because I don't think it's necessarily an Ummah issue, but like our, our global community is going. But there are absolutely spaces where, you know, people are marginalized because of because of their identity. And it's it's definitely sad to see. Well, but there's an issue. Let me before you go on to the to the next one, there's also I mean, we could serve as leaders here at this moment in terms of identity and marginalization, particularly with our Asian American brothers and sisters who are now under that microscope that we with which we are so familiar as Muslims. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the attacks on the communities and so on. And I think there's an opportunity here to create um, alliances and friendships and mentorship about how to remain courageous in the face of, of fear. I will always be an advocate for a rainbow coalition. So I think that that's absolutely amazing work and we have to come together if it's going to, to be, because I believe that it's, you know, one of those sayings where like, you know, they came for X population and I said nothing. They came for mm -hmm. Y, I said, then they came for me and there was no one to say anything for me. And you're absolutely right. And he said, this is a struggle that we have really, um, I mean, I'm I'm 25 and I, I've experienced it my whole life. So I'm sure that the people who were around before then know that it, it's really hard sometimes to go through TSA and not be peeved at the fact that you've been randomly selected again. Randomly or, selected. Or, or, or go, you know, to the, to the grocery store and think, oh, what, is there something in my teeth or is someone just kind of like looking at me in like a racist kind of way or, or a, you know, xenophobic kind of way. So it's a heavy, hate is a heavy weight, I will always say. Um, but I think love can uplift that, absolutely. And I want to apologize or apologize or celebrate if anyone hears the azan in my, <laughs> in my home, it's time for Isha in Eastern Kentucky. But I want to kind of uh, end with, with two questions. One of them being, as you've entered women's rights spaces, um, have you found that you've needed to defend women's rights in Islam or are there misunderstandings or do you find spaces to be rather welcoming when, when you discuss um, your experience and your rights in Islam? Well, I didn't know women didn't have equal rights growing up. It sounds like you too, Jimmy. I, we were equal, you know, we were born equal. Our fathers respected us. There was never that. So that was a learning up, uh, thing for me. It's like, what are you talking about? And, and so I, Fortunately, I got to explore the world as a reporter and I got to see some of that happening, but I identified it as cultural distinctions that weren't religious. You know, the, what we had in common in religion was we all knew what to do when it was time to pray. You pulled your scarf over your head, you, you made rulu and you went to the local mosque, no matter what country I was in, you know, that all, we all had in common, but, but the uh, interaction among men and women could be different and the uh, stature of women might be different in, in a variety of places. But we, I thought it was always, always important to identify that as cultural distinctions rather than religious. Agreed. I don't think I'll add anything more to that because I know you want to fit in your last question before the time is up, Sister Iman. Absolutely. So there is a famous song by Betty Hutton where she once said, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> Any and, get your gun. And and for for women, you know, we've been told anything you can do, I can do in, you know, as a as a mom in high heels and whatever kind of, you know, attribute that that you want to assign. And I, I want to know, you know, who are the women who have really inspired you to be that better version of yourself? be it when you started your journey or even people now who continue to inspire you. Um, I want to end with, with a note of inspiration. So if you can share, I'd be pleased. Thank you. Sure. I, I would love to share my namesake. Um, my parents named me Jamia and niece Adams. And niece is the name of my grandmother, who was the first African-American head nurse at Charity Hospital in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, the hospital no longer exists after the storm. It was torn down and destroyed. Um, but she was the first head nurse and, um, you know, 
the idea that my father gave me this name, this honor, his second daughter, I just, I carry that weight because I have gone on to be a first, you know, to be the first to um, uh, graduate from graduate school in my family, to be the first to travel to different countries, to be the first to work for um, the, the first African-American president of the United States of America and, and do all of these different things, to, you know, to, to do be a part of some historical moments at the NAACP and in and, and some other roles. And, and I feel like that legacy of my grandmother, grandmother and niece um, really propelled me, that, that family name. So she definitely was inspirational to me. We really are twins because my grandmother was also an, uh, a nurse in the uh, OR and the ER uh, in California um, back in the day. And um, uh, she never, you know, had, she was also the, a preacher's wife. And in her time, the, the wife of the preacher didn't have a job. Her job was to, have, you know, host cookies and tea parties, you know, for the, for the women of the church and help raise money. So I hadn't thought of her in that way until you just said it, Jimmy, you know, um, how she defied um, the norms and was self-fulfilled uh, with the talents and skills that she had. So Ethel and Marguerite Turner. Um, I didn't really get to know my paternal grandmother, Zahra Mehdi. I had, I had two days with her in my entire life when we went to Iraq to meet her. And I, I she was a feisty, feisty thing, um, tiny, henna hands, dyed her own hair uh, red, rolled her own cigarettes. I'm thinking, who is this lady? And when my father and I went to meet her, she was in her room in a, in a home living alone. She's a widow sitting in her slip. She hadn't seen my father probably in, I don't know, 20 years. He's a grown man now, but she didn't cover her or anything. It was her son, you know? But when we went outside, you could see only her left eye because she put on her abaya and it was, she was all covered up. So my sisters never saw her full face because they didn't go with me to her, to her home. But she struck me as another strong woman who, who led her life the way she said she was going to lead it. So here, here's, here's to grandmothers. And there are a lot of women also, uh, Zeba Rehman, who is the uh, senior um, uh, person at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art in their in programs department, um, uh, Aziz al Hibri, who I named before, uh, Barbara Nimri Aziz, who's another journalist, Iraqi American who's done some remarkable uh, work. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there, are, there are other women uh, whose example does uh, certainly inspire me. Well, I know that you two are twins, but I want to be a triplet. So <laughs> make some room. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I want to thank both of our panelists, Jamia Adams and Anissa Mehdi, for just, you know, spending the afternoon with us and sharing words of absolute wisdom. Um, both of you are absolute role models for, for us all, and I am so moved and honored to be the one getting to moderate this conversation. I know I've learned so much, um, and I want to thank you for all the work that you, you have done and you continue to do, and I'm sure you will continue, continuously do. Um, it's definitely felt. And you're certainly making the, the journey for this future, you know, member of Congress a little bit easier because seeing strong women like you is, is absolutely, you know, something that puts my mind at ease of, look, I haven't, I don't have to do this alone. Um, and I'm sure many, many others will follow suit. Um, as for our viewers, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I hope you're as tickled as I am with, with both of our panelists. If you are interested in checking out more forums, visit our website, mpac.splashthat.com. Um, and we look forward to having you at future events. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a pleasant night. Bye. Thank you, Man. Great job.